Welcome to the Get With It podcast. I will be your host, Elizabeth. This podcast will focus on the decline of women in technology and how our grassroots organization works with the community to foster relationships and reducing the gap of women in tech. We will be talking with both men and women on how to continue to move the needle forward on those relationships. For more information, please check us out at getwitit.org. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Get With It podcast. We are in January now. 2019. And today my guest is Dr. Kevin Cruxel. i sure I screwed that up. Did I say that right? Yeah, you said it right. All right. Uh, people in my family say it all different ways. So listen, it's, it's one of my weaknesses. I can I can say what my weakness is and names is one of them. I often like to wait till people see it spelled out and ask me how it's pronounced. Oh, there you go. It does have an X in there. That's why I was trying yeah. to. And then I tell them, you know, Jones. Jo- <laughs> they stare at me for a while. Not sure if it's a joke or not. <laughs> so um, I have the great pleasure of working with Kevin at Xspeed Software. Here's where we do the shout out for Rao. Xspeed Software. Go. Speed Software is the greatest place in town. Yep, this is where we do our Speed shout out. So it can do anything for you. It can make your wildest dreams come true. <laughs> From a data science analytics, <laughs> I guess there is that qualifier. <laughs> that agile practice. I don't know about that side of things, but the data science is pretty strong. So, um, with that being said, Kevin is the data scientist director. What the hell is your title? I think my official title is Director of Data Science. Oh, so you just flipped what I said. Mm-hmm. So it makes it sound more professional. I, right. I do the hodgepodge so of... So I sound professional and you sound wrong. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. And I will accept it. I will accept it. So we're going to talk about data science in a minute. But if everybody was paying attention, I said, Doctor, Kevin is an astronaut. Not an astronaut. <sighs> He's got, like, you don't have the suit at home? I don't have the suit at home. Damn it. I've only been on two NASA flights, and they didn't go to space. Where the hell did they go? They went up really high, you know, almost to the edge of our atmosphere. Yeah, well, not atmosphere, but high up in the atmosphere, about 60,000 feet on the Sophia telescope. And flew in convoluted routes as we opened up the side of the plane and used the telescope inside of it to make observations, but not to space. Oh, my God. That's so cool. Really? Yeah. So it's a giant 747 that NASA has retrofitted to fly, you know, longer and higher. And there's a... Is there a first class? Well, there's the first class section, but, you know, there's no food served. There's no stewardesses. No booze. No booze. Yes. All you know, liquids have to be in a resealable container. We tested the microwave on my flight, and the burrito test was a failure. I was able to actually detect the burrito we were cooking in our observations, so oh. not something you can do on flights. Wow. So you're in this airplane, <laughs> uh-huh. and you go up 60,000 feet, yeah. and you are taking pictures of what? Uh, so I was looking at nearby galaxies. Well, wait a minute. You just said you were testing burritos. But yeah. Okay, so you were double duty, well, burrito testing you see, and galaxy testing. <laughs> there's two types of people in the airplane. Okay. There's pilots, and then there's astronomer people. And the astronomer people really want their data, <laughs> and the pilots really wanted burritos. Okay, I see. So I was looking at nearby galaxies and the gas that is lit up in star formation to... My research was on figuring out the composition of that gas. So I was taking observations of that. Then at the very end of the first flight, the microwave had just been installed on the plane. So we tested a frozen burrito, basically doing a duplicated observation of what we had just done to see if we could pick up the microwave in the observation. And it failed. Yeah, we we saw the microwave. So no burrito. No burrito. Sad pilots. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So when did you do this? Oh, let's see. 
Kevin's only 24, so this will be amazing. I'm not 24. (laughs) (laughs) That was a, let's see, that was a few years ago. I want to say that was 2015. Oh, you just, oh, that, yeah, that's, what are you talking about? A couple years back. Yeah. So was that when you were teaching? Kevin, Kevin was a, so that's when I was a a doctor of professor. I was a researcher at OSU when I did that. Yeah. Okay. So what was your teaching thing? Oh, it was a research thing. Oh, it was a research? Yeah. I thought you taught a class, though. Well, I, I taught various classes at different places. So oh. I taught several classes at Indiana University for, you know, introductory and, you know, intro st- style classes. I taught a correspondence course for a while. And then at the University of Toledo and OSU, it, they were both research appointments that I was at. But I taught when people needed a substitute. Mm. So, <clears throat> Darren, I already had shared this with Kevin because he's he. I didn't want to set the bar too high for myself. I mean, he's a doctor, he's an astronaut, data science guy. I mean, right? Like got everything going right, and then here comes me. So, I took an astronomy class in college, Michigan State. Go green, woo woo, Sparty, <laughs> and um. I was telling Kevin about my experience in this astronomy class, and this is exactly right, mm-hmm. stars and mm-hmm. the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and yeah. everything else that goes on out Asterisms. there. Asterisms. Correct. Says those aren't constellations. I have no idea. And um, <laughs> the class was a Monday through Friday, and I'm pretty sure the professor's probably dead by now because he was old and monotone and... It was an 8 a.m. class, and we sat in a planetarium, and we got in these seats, and we put our feet up, and we leaned back. Well, I'll be damned if I didn't sleep through that whole semester and failed that class. Only class I failed in college. Proud of that fact. Second fact, though, not so proud of, I didn't learn shit about stars. Well, that was was the class that I did really well in in college. (laughs) Part of it was... It wasn't until my uh, senior year that it was realized that I'd never taken the introductory course. So I had finished every single astrophysics course you could take at my undergrad, including all their graduate courses, except for the intro course, which I had already been a TA for several times, but it was still decided that I needed to take it. That's ridiculous. That you know So why I might have thrown they wanted, the curve. <laughs> they wanted your money. That's what they wanted. I wasn't paying them money. The scholarship. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> they wanted to get their money's worth, shall we say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so what does that tell you? I mean, really smart dude. And then there's me. Not not hanging out at 8 a.m. classes. I s- slept through them, snored through them. You know, when I started college, I thought maybe I would be a chemistry major. And that first chemistry class was at 7 a.m., and yeah, I slept like, through that one too. And that's when I realized that physics was for me because those classes didn't start till 10. <laughs> I like that you've decided your whole future career around what time the classes were in college. <laughs> Getting up for a 7 a.m. class? <laughs> it's crazy. So I should have probably taken that astronomy class like later in the day then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Okay. So... You slept through the chemistry, decided to go into astrophysics, because mm-hmm. that's natural. Well, yeah. What, seriously? Did you wake up one day and be like, I'm going to be an astronaut? No. You know, I, uh, I knew I liked physics, so figured I would do physics. And then as I was going through the various classes, I had a hole in my schedule that I needed you know, another three credit hours to fill. And there was this astronomy course. That would work if I wanted to do physics teaching. If I did straight physics, it would work as a, you know, just some other credits that fill in there. So I figured, why not? Why not? And it was a lot of fun. And I started working at the telescope at night and then got a summer research experience for undergraduates. It's an NSF-funded program, RU. So I went and did that and was hooked. And so I just kept doing it until I couldn't get a job and then got a real job oh damn couldn't get a job yeah story of everybody's life 
Okay, so our <sighs> listeners are probably like, what the hell does this guy have to do with technology? Absolutely nothing. Oh, <laughs> That's not true. Okay, so 2018. Well, you know, a little bit before that, you know, where I said I couldn't get a job. Right. It was the uh, that point of what am I doing with my life? Oh, my God. We've all had that. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the answer was doing a whole lot of work and not getting paid well at all. Uh, no good. And no one wanted to pay me even that to continue on. So I started looking at the options. And really, you know, my degree is in astrophysics. But what that meant is I had spent many, many years learning all sorts of statistics uh, and ways to look at data, clean data, manipulate programs and codes and images and everything else. And so that translated very well into what was needed in the industry for data science. Because, you know, degrees in astrophysics and statistics, knowledge of computer programming, ability to work with ridiculous amounts of data. So you can code. Yeah. Well, you know, it's more than code. It was also problem solving, which when you have something like a galaxy that's six million light years away. Can you say far, far away? Far, far away. (laughs) So in a galaxy (laughs) far, far 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 away, away. a star is born. (laughs) And that star... I feel like you should put the Star Wars theme song on the back of this. (laughs) We don't have the budget for that, I don't think. Damn it. (laughs) However, if it's played on a kazoo, then it's parody. Or, you know, it's us doing it as a tribute. That's true. That's true. But but anyway, you, you have this gas in a galaxy far, far away that's being lit up by a star that's pumping out all sorts of ultraviolet radiation. And we're detecting that light on a telescope here on Earth. And you want to figure out, with just the light you see, how do you figure out what it's made of? It's a hard problem. That is a hard problem. You know, or, you know, we have a similar type of thing where light is filtered through dust. And you want to figure out how that, what are all the properties of that dust? How does it interact with the light? But again, it's, you know, millions and billions of light years away. So how do you figure out all those problems? Well, that's what I did. So now you apply that to other problems, you know, a supply chain. Well, you know, it's a different type of data. It's a different type of problem, but it's just a different problem in a different context. And how do you solve it? So that's what you do with code. That's what I do. That's what you do with data scientists. Yeah. Okay, so hard question. You might not know the answer, but you're a doctor, so you probably do. How many women data scientists do you know? (sighs) Define no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you don't have to have a personal relationship with them. Because it's, you know. We know one together. True. We, we, you and I have a mutual person we mm-hmm. are acquainted with. Can we say that? Acquainted? Yeah, I think we're both acquainted with John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that not no, who you're No, that's of? not who uh, I was thinking of. Yeah, no, Kelly. Correct. Yeah. And uh, Kelly it was on your team, worked with you. Mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. But is that, th- is that normal? I don't know that I would you're say You're not going to offend anyone. It's not normal, but it's not abnormal. Okay, so for women to be a data scientist is not is is, is something that it, foreseeable. Oh, it's completely foreseeable. Okay. So I I also know, let's see, a couple other people out of OSU that decided not to go the route of academics uh, from astrophysics, and both of them, actually, no, three of them are now data scientists. Okay. So that's. We're talking women, though. Wh- no, no. That's oh, women. okay. That's All only right. the women. So if you include Kelly in that list, four women that I worked with at OSU that were doing research in astrophysics, all four are now data scientists. Were they all doctors? Is Kelly a doctor? Yeah. Yeah, they're all doctors. They're all doctors? Yeah. How, can I be like the doctor of Agile? If, if you get a doctorate in it. Why? Well, that that's how you become a doctor. I mean... 
Darren is agreeing with you. I guess I have to go with Darren. I mean, you could go to some school and get a certificate that says they give you a doctorate in something. Okay, that might and, be me. You know, so maybe it's a non-accredited institution and the paper <laughs> means nothing, just like when you buy a star. That's but, true. You know, so Kelly, okay, so Kelly is a doctor. <laughs> she is a data scientist and like three other people at OSU, three mm-hmm. other women. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is going to be a tough question. Are you ready? Okay. Because I'm trying to like put what you said about problem solving to the test here. Okay. So women problem solve differently than men, correct? Sure. Okay. We'll just, let's just say yes. Okay. Let's just, for the fun of it, say yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Women are better at problem solving than men. (laughs) (laughs) Kevin's staring at me. I'm not going to go with a yes on that, but I'm also not going with a no. Okay. I think everyone solves problems in an individual way, and some people are better at problem solving than other people. Okay. And I think some problems are more tuned to certain demographics of the population. God, you are so politically correct. And you're so professional. (laughs) Am I right? Yeah, Darren's shaking his head totally. But, you know, if if you've never had exposure to something, you're not going to think of that in terms of your solution. So there are definitely certain things in problems men are going to overlook – and there's other things that women are going to overlook, and there's you know splits along racial categories, but it doesn't go into the innate ability of any one of those groups to solve a problem. Hmm. That sounds like we a just approach them differently. Doctor answer. Doctor. 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 Uh, I like that answer though because you correct. I think women look at things differently than men. Just my opinion. Yeah. And I can have that opinion. Yeah, I think women... Well, and I think they do. I would agree with that opinion, that they look at things differently than men. Yeah. They're coming from a different context, a different social norm in, at some level. And so that brings a different perspective. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Do you agree? Yes, Darren shakes his head. <laughs> he agrees. Darren okay. speaks a lot is what I'm gathering. He's the silent partner of the podcast. Yeah. Yep. See? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let's go back now that we have established that women make great data scientists. Mm-hmm. Well, and I should say that, you know, I said four in the number, but that's of the data scientists that I know that came out of OSU in the four years that I was there. Well, that's a horrible, yeah. horrible percentage. Well, but you you cut me off before we went further than that. Sorry. (laughs) You know, I know several more than just those four here in Columbus. Oh, okay. In in the Columbus economy. I know of more that are connected to those people in other metropolises. You know, there's there's a much higher density of data scientists in New York or L.A. or, you know, Scandinavia, Fiji. I don't know. Botswana, somewhere. <laughs> they're spread out. Yeah. They're, they're all over the place. And so there are many more than those four female data scientists. Though. Oh, well, yeah. I would assume there would I was just saying, somewhere. out of the people in that cohort, yeah, but if you, you easily about, found four. That's pretty sad, though. Four? Wait, wait, was Kelly in your class? Well, she was in that group that I was counting. She oh. wasn't in my class, but we were researchers together. Okay. Okay. But, you know, again, from that group, I know of two men that are data scientists. Oh. So. Okay. You know, it's. We're not, not talking like a large group of people. Though. No, no, no. Like we're not. Okay. So when I will be honest with you, when um, I first met you and <clears throat> we won't, we won't talk about it, <laughs> but um, let's say the second time I met you. No. <laughs> Um, (laughs) um, a data scientist, like, I'm like, holy shit, like, this guy is, like, really, really smart, right? Like, I will never understand what he does. And he had, like, graphs on his computer. And then 
if anybody knows Kevin, he's got a sense of humor. So I do to sit there and have a conversation about data scientists and being like, holy shit, like this, do I even understand what you're saying? And then there's a picture of a dude bowling behind him. Not a dude, an albino. Uh, an albino bowling. And like, you're, I'm sitting in his office like, how do I even take this guy seriously? And he's got a huge unicorn head that he puts on. And it, it's just, it's. And a concrete eyeball. See, how do, how do you even, you know what I mean? So I feel better now that you explained it to me. <laughs> Um, your <laughs> problems, it's looking at problem solving with data and problem and, solving with data and math. Yeah. See, that makes me feel so much better because, you know, people have all this data and I can problem solve with just math and computers and then give them back the numbers and the data as it is. And they look at it and say, I don't know what the hell this means. Yeah. What'd you give me? Right. I had numbers and data before and you gave me numbers and data. So you, you have to take the question they're asking, look at the data they give you, figure out how it addresses the actual problem they voiced, do your fancy math and numbers, but then out of it, pull out some useful tidbits of information. 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 That's right. I like that. Information. And information. <laughs> and, and put it back together in a cohesive picture. For them. For them. So you're pretty much like simplifying it. Yeah. Okay. I like that explanation because I gotta be honest with you. I, it's a little intimidating. Right. Data scientist is, is an intimidating title. You know, that that's what we're told to do so that we can make people feel intimidated when we go out. Okay. Well, that, you know, it works. It helps. It does help. It does that's help. That's generally why we wear cloaks around as well. Oh, so is that it the looks mysterious? The form is that the the yeah, people are never sure. Is that a data scientist or a druid? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. <laughs> so this is such a side note right now, but um, Kevin and I have something in common. I'm not a data scientist, but we love shoes. That is true. Love shoes. And so we comment on each other's shoes. You didn't comment on my shoes today, though. They were the, the sparkly slip-ons, weren't they? No, I brought those in because I was oh. afraid my feet were going to hurt. Oh, those are very nice. Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I have some boots on today. They are black boots with, what is that, a five-inch heel? I don't know, but I'm afraid. Like, I am so shocked I haven't fallen on my ass yet. Yeah. And... um. And let's see, Kevin has on a pair of red, what are those? So it's a, it's a red burgundy patent leather vinyl high top. Do you see what's on the bottom here? You got like a little instruction pad going on here. Um, oh, this is all about the stars and being earthly and above. Oh, this is all you. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's all about you on the sole of your shoe. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Kevin wears fish flops around the office. Yep. First of all, Kevin walks around the office with no shoes on, which is amazing to me because I don't trust. I'm a very untrustworthy person when it comes to what the hell's in the carpet. So I, you don't care, do you? I spent six months living in Africa, basically barefoot in the Sahel. And I am pretty sure I've walked on much nastier stuff than what's in our carpet. Okay. <laughs> Sahel, is that a nice way of saying hell? No, the Sahel is a, an area in sub-Saharan Africa oh. where it's still, you know, dusty kind of mm. plains. Not really plainsy, but oh, it's have, the Sahel. I have not been there. Mm. <clears throat> you well, should. It's fantastic. Well, uh-uh. doesn't sound like my kind of place. Well, you know, it's hot, but. Yep, right there. Antelope. And just amazing people and culture. So what were you doing there? <laughs> I was studying French African literature and anthropology. Where the hell does that come into play? <laughs> Did I just like miss a whole like decade of your life somewhere? No. I was, so I, I lived in France for two years. Doing what? Uh, so I was a, doing a service mission for my church. Okay. And, you know, came back speaking French. And two years service mission. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then, you know, I could qualify to get 14 credit hours of 
A in all sorts of French classes, but I had to be enrolled in a class to take the test. And that's a huge GPA pattern right there, and it let me register for a whole bunch more classes. So I signed up for this course, was taking it, and then they announced a uh, experimental, uh, brand new study abroad program in uh, Senegal, studying French African literature. And I figured, when else will I get a chance to live in Africa and study with artists and writers and novelists? But no, Kevin was not married at that time. No. So, so you know, he had no baggage. I went to Africa and put a pause on studying physics and studied French African literature and anthropology for a few months and then came back and picked up on the physics. Do you have a degree in that? Uh, let's see, I was one class short of my African studies minor, was two classes short of my ballroom dance minor. Oh my god, Kevin, it's like you get so close and then you stop. Yeah. Ballroom dancing, come on. So I just finished the pesky math minor and physics degree. Jeez. Lame. Lame. Lame-o. So <laughs> I'm not even sure how we got on the Africa talk. Oh, we were talking about how Kevin doesn't wear shoes around the office. <laughs> and um, see how quickly we digress on this? <laughs> and, um, but he does wear fish flops. Darren, I think I'm going to get you some of these. So they're actual fish. Well, like, they're they're rubber. They're, they're not, rubber. It's not an actual. It's fish not an that actual. Right, but it's um. It looks like a fish. Do mm-hmm. we know what kind of fish? Looks kind of like a trout. Trout, maybe. Yeah. And um, its mouth is open, and nobody can see me. I'm like doing the oh, um, the <laughs> mouth is open, and his toes stick out of the mouth, and then the tail like flips up. Behind the heel? Behind yep. the heel. They're fantastic. And, um, I, yeah, I've never seen anything like them. They're very impressive. Why, thank you. Very impressive. I Are got those them your... on Amazon. Oh, there we go. You know what? You can go to my website and go to the bottom of the page and click on the Amazon and you can get yourself some fish flops <laughs> through my website. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. I did some branding there. Um, yeah, so... There's lots of things about Kevin that has nothing to do with data. Well, yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> you have Legos. Who did the Lego collection in your office? Uh, I, I did. He built a NASA rocket. No. Yeah? What's It's the uh, rocket. Out of Legos or what? Yeah. Darren, that's, yep. those are it right there, buddy. <laughs> yep. Darren found the fish flops on Darren. Amazon. <laughs> Darren, Darren's ordering a pair now. Um, they'll be here just in time for the warm weather. So I did not actually build a, a rocket for NASA. No, 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 that's no. That's what you're implying. Your Lego set. Oh, yeah. I put together Legos of rockets. I've got it's a rocket. lots of different NASA space sets. You know what, mate? What did I say in your office the one day that I was so happy to see? Oh, my God. Do you even listen to me when I talk to you? Uh-huh. There were you women. You got the smell out of the carpet. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't clean the carpets. <laughs> you had women Legos. Oh, yeah, the, the women of NASA Lego set. Yes. Yeah, that's a fantastic I, set. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got four different women that were, you know, part of NASA going back from kind of the, the space race up to the Hubble Space Telescope and highlighting their contributions in a nice little Lego set. So Super cute. I love it. Oh, it's it. fantastic. And it's in Kevin's office. So mm-hmm. I love that it's women. It's women. It's true. It is true. And you can get that on Amazon. So go you could go website. to the link on the website. <laughs> go to <laughs> elizabethtolia.com. <Are> <laughs> I feel like you, you just brought me on as an advertisement. You know what? <laughs> Whatever works, right? Just kidding. So not only is Kevin an interesting fellow about being an astronaut and a doctor, I'm just going to keep tell- calling you an astronaut because I noticed. think it's pretty cool. We could actually take that unicorn head and we could make it into an astronaut hat for you. That's true. We could. And then you could just sit at your desk Put like with a that. big fishbowl around it. Yes. Yeah. We'd have to get rid of the cone, though, or the thing that sticks out. Or you find a little insert to put on the fishbowl. Oh, yeah, we could do that. Okay. I'll I'll do some investigative work on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so, another interesting fact about Kevin. I'm excited to hear what this one is. Are you sure? 
I don't know. So, um, with joining Xpeed, here's another shout out for Xpeed. I've learned that in the office, I am the grilled cheese plain food eater. Mm. Right? I am very picky. Mm-hmm. It's just, just known, like, they go out for Indian. They don't even ask me to go anymore because they just know the answer is no. So, Kevin. Yes. Took me to the taco truck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm i weary about food trucks to begin with because of the whole sanitizing thing. And I just sanitizing had a... Sanitizing thing? San, whatever. So, like, I, the, Just very, very, like, superstitious about... They're back there with a taser, and when you start <sighs> cleaning, they shock you and they could, incapacitate you? You have no idea what's going on in those things. So... Right, because you've been sanitized. Sanitized. Um... <laughs> But, so what's the name of the taco truck? Give them a shout out. I forget the actual name of the taco it's like truck. But El Taco. It's, uh, it's, in, it's in the D1 parking lot up off the 23. Yeah, the D1 parking lot, which is D1 is the building, and then they sit in the parking lot off of 23. So we all decide to take on the coldest day of the year so far a trip to the taco truck. Mm-hmm. And I... I'm like very weary about what I'm going to eat at the taco truck. So we get there and I order. It was delicious, by the way. Shout out to this taco truck. It was so good. But I got the... Tr- and they didn't tase you. And they didn't. But I got the traditional like meat, cheese, lettuce. Real simple, right? Right. American style. Kevin, mm-hmm. what did you get? See, I got a, a chicharron taco. Uh, a buche taco. Yeah, why don't you tell everybody what what those are, in case. Well, your your chicharron is your pork rind taco, essentially, and then the the buche is your uh, beef belly, and then I think my third was the chorizo, which is a spicy you, Mexican yeah, sausage. sausage. Delicious. So, um, Kevin also enjoys all sorts of exotic foods. Correct. Yes. What's the most exotic food you've eaten? We've had this conversation before. I've had lots of exotic foods, but, you know, it's, again, what do you define as exotic? I know. For me, what you ate that day was exotic. Right. (laughs) You know, some of the probably what people would classify as the least thought of foods weren't as what they would think of as exotic. Okay. For example, when I was living in France, I had a steak. It was steak. It was delicious. Just, you know, cooked as you would a normal steak. But it was horse. Fantastic steak. But, you know, not what you normally think of. So a non-exotic meal of what we would normally would not have as exotic meat. Hmm. Horse. You ate horse. I ate horse, yeah. Have you eaten cat? Yes. Dog? No. Not had dog yet. We've had this conversation in the office because I'm engrossed by the fact that... Fed Zebu. Yeah. What the... <laughs> nobody eats that shit. What, are you serious? Yeah. Ugh. I figure you've got, you can try anything once to see what it is. So if I'm at a place... Do you tell people it tastes like chicken? Because people t- say that all the time, too. Generally, no. Frog legs taste like chicken. Frog legs do taste a bit like chicken. Yeah. I've had those. Yeah. Cat tastes exactly like rabbit. See? Rattlesnake. It's like a mixture between chicken and lobster. (laughs) Darren's like, all right, well, I'll take your word for it. (laughs) He's not interested in trying any of that. So, okay. So, exotic food eater did a stint in Africa and France just for the hell of it. Uh Uh-huh. Is an astronaut. No. Got his doctorate degree. Oh, I'm going through the list of credentials here. That's I know, but, not... I'm, but I'm not an astronaut. What? <laughs> I feel like you are. Well, to be an astronaut, you have to go to space. But that's... But, and I've studied but space, go... but I've not been to space. Okay, but nobody goes to space anymore. We send robots. Well, yeah, but astronauts still go to the International Space Station, which is in low Earth orbit. So I guess, you know... It's what we consider the edge of space. And I've not been there. What's 60,000 feet? Far, far away. That's a lot less. (laughs) (laughs) A lot lower 
than the International Space Station is what that is. You know, it's about double your average commercial flight, I think, but it's... Well, wait a minute. So, to be an astronaut, you have to go to the space station, and that makes you an astronaut? Well, just saying, that's where we send astronauts nowadays. Okay. Because we don't but, go to the moon right now. But you're Dr. Kevin Croxall. True. Okay. Astronaut. I've never been to space. But you've been close. Doesn't that count? Well, but again, I studied space, didn't travel to space. Do you want to go to space? I think it'd be really cool. Yeah. Are you like going to be the person that when Mars is available for the common folk to go to, you're going to go? I don't know about that one. No? Because, you know, I want to come back and live. Not. Oh, not. not. Just go to Mars and die. And die. Okay. Well, you could go to the space station. Yeah. I'd go to the space station if they had extra seat or, you know, some rich person wanted to pay the millions of dollars it would take to get me there. Now, that's key. You have to pay to be an astronaut to get there. Well, if you want to do it in vacation rich guy mode. Oh. Or, or rich gal. Or rich gal. Let's not forget but, about our yeah. fabulous women. So <laughs> if, I, if I want to go to the space station and I'm Dr. Elizabeth Tolia, ElizabethTolia.com, <laughs> I, <laughs> I <laughs> side note she's not a doctor <laughs> i let's say i did everything you've done okay mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i'm a physicist an astronaut everything just like kevin <laughs> right if you're just like kevin you're not an astronaut <laughs> so i have everything you have <laughs> And I go down to the space state, or I go down to NASA, and I'm like, I want to go into space so I can say I'm an astronaut. Is that all I have to do? Uh, no, you don't do that. Oh, you don't do that. No. So, so Joe Schmo down the street can't, can't just go can't up just to NASA. Can't just walk up and say I want to be an astronaut. You, okay. You have to be accepted to their astronaut training program. Oh. Make it through the program, and then get selected for one of the missions to space. And this is the thing that they put you in the chair and flip you upside down and sure. around? Yeah. Okay. So I would fail that. Yeah. Because I don't do good on roller coasters. Oh, yeah. That'd be an issue. Yeah. So I would fail out. So so why haven't you done that? Because my job was studying space. And I could do that through telescopes, not by going to space. But Most of what the astronauts do in low Earth orbit are low gravity experiments, not actually learning about mm. galaxies and stars and so on and so forth. Oh. Well, you could put a spin on it. Yeah. You could put your name out there. Spin on the market. Yeah. But they don't really have the stuff to study that from the International Space Station. Oh. So... I can study it just as well here on ground as I can there. And so since I lack a really compelling argument for them to send me, they're probably not going to send the money to send me since I don't need to go. I just want to. But then you can really say you're an astronaut. Yes. yes. Then I could say I was an astronaut if I went to space. I'm going to just call you an astronaut because you're I've, close. I've, I've picked up on that. <laughs> you're as close as I'm going to know an astronaut. Although, what's his face? John Glenn. <laughs> right well he what passed away face John but, Glenn. <laughs> but i've ran into him a couple of times so okay well what else can we know about kevin dr crab and crossall Cro croxall <laughs> i i don't I, know. I wanted to make it sound professional okay well, you know it depends on what you want to know well you know i what are let's say i'm a young female wanting to go into data science, what mm -hmm. advice would you give me? So there are a couple different routes nowadays into data science. Okay. There is the route of the specific courses and training for data science. You, a lot of universities are starting to create pathways specifically into data science where you learn Python or R, you learn some of these tools, you learn about the statistics that are needed. And so you're, you're specifically taught those tools for the express purpose of doing data science. Okay. 
So that's one pathway. Okay. And it can be a good pathway. Another pathway is essentially the route I took, even though I didn't know it at the time, where I went into a discipline that taught me the vast majority of those tools, but centered around a different issue or a different topic. And now that I learned how to actually use those in a scientific manner and really understand how you do an experiment, how you approach data, how you interrogate it, I now just do that in a different subject. Okay. So essentially I learned, you know, I learned all the programming, I learned all the statistics in dealing with data to solve problems, and now I'm just solving different problems as opposed to just learning those on their own. So I I find it's a slightly different context in how you apply it. And you know, some of the programs are new, so it's hard to evaluate how they compare. But, you know, it, it's definitely you have both those routes. And if you know that you really want to go into this, but you really love some field, whether it's, you know, biology or political science or what have you, that has that computational aspect, because you, you have that in most programs nowadays – you know, there's computational psychology. There's in political science, you do all the polling and statistics and right. journalism. You study all those sorts of things as well. Economic, financial. Yeah, economics. So if there's some topic that really interests you, you know, my brother does digital humanities. So I know. Who knows what that is? Yeah, what is that? Uh, humanities on a computer? I, I guess. I, but, you know, <laughs> he's learning how to take humanities data, put it into a, a you know, a Python context and look at it in different ways. So it's, you know, you learn some of those skills and the things that are there around maybe a, a concept or a subject that really pulls at you. And if you know, well, but I want to do data science, but I'm also interested in this. Well, I can kill two birds with one stone as I learn about that field and then apply that knowledge I've learned somewhere else, as opposed to say, well, I'm just going to learn that knowledge for that knowledge sake and then move on. So you really it could be applied in any any field. I think so, yeah. So Cuz I mean I I think data science is a it's a poor name in my opinion. What would you name it? I don't know. <laughs> but what science doesn't use data? All science uses data. All decisions we make use data. Correct. Wouldn't you say every field uses data? Every field uses data in some form or another. So there is no science that doesn't use data. So all science is data science. But data science is this weird subfield right now where we're applying the scientific method to data. So we're using the constructs of how we approach science with data that's not necessarily for a scientific purpose, it's for a business purpose. But you want to approach it in the thought manner you would approach something else in trying to understand it. That was pretty deep. We got to come up. That's what I do. Yeah, I know. You get deep <laughs> real quick. We got to get up. That was real deep. Mm. People are still contemplating what you just said. They're like processing it. Mm. I'll give them a moment to catch their breath. Wow, that was pretty yeah. deep. Right, Darren? That was pretty deep. <laughs> Darren's ordering his flip-flops. His fish flops. <laughs> he likes them. <laughs> He's buying for his whole family. Hawaii. You could send them out to Hawaii. They would love it. Isn't your family in Hawaii? They would love fish flops. Out in Hawaii. Have you ever been to Hawaii? I have. You have? I have. Oh, did you like it? Oh, it was fantastic. Darren loves Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I've never been. I've only been to the Big Island. So. Oh, only to the Big Islands. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a job interview at a telescope out there. <laughs> nice job, Darren. That's where the telescopes are. The telescope. Yeah. What did you look at? Getting a job. <laughs> you went out to Hawaii to get a job? Yeah, I had a job interview out there. So they flew me out to Hawaii. Shut up. They flew you out to Hawaii? And my wife, yeah. It was great. 
Was it like a mini vacation? Kind of. Okay, so what was it for? <laughs> I know a job, but like what? <laughs> could we have a little bit more descriptive? But to be to be a support astronomer at the observatory out there. So you just look at the stars all day? Well, I help other people look at I would help other people look at stars or other things in space. Who are these other people? Astronomers. Other scientists that have applied to use the telescope time. So it's essentially you're you're a resident expert on the instrumentation on how things work to help them with their observations. Okay. So how many of these telescopes do we have here in the America? Uh, you know, there's not a huge number of giant telescopes in the world. Is you this know. a giant telescope in Hawaii? Yeah. So yeah. you you've got the the Kex in Hawaii. Um, you've got a couple more in Hawaii from you know Subaru and Gemini. Then you you've got <laughs> Why Hawaii. Nothing against Hawaii, Darren. Nothing against Hawaii. I'm just curious. Is it because well, the weather? Is... So so you look for a few things when you're selecting where to put a telescope. Okay. One, you want it to be dry with a relatively high number of clear nights. Okay. And you know Hawaii. Really good at that. Lots of clear sky. Lots of clear sky. Got you. You want it to be as high in altitude as possible so that you're above as much of the atmosphere as possible. So on the big island of Hawaii, you have Mauna Kea, which is you know an inactive volcano, gets you above a huge chunk of the atmosphere where most people have trouble breathing. So yeah, thin enough air. There's less twinkling of stars, much more stable viewing. Okay. And three... You need enough infrastructure that you can run it. So you've got to have electricity. You need, you know, roads to get your liquid nitrogen up there to cool things. You got to be able to take giant instruments up if something breaks. Be able to have the facilities to support fixing it. And Hawaii has all that, eh? Yeah. So you, you've got wow. all that in Hawaii. You know, Arizona is another location that has a, a fair number of large telescopes. Oh well, yeah, it's uh, real dry and heat. And, Dry heat out there. Yeah. And Chile also has another. Do you ever been to site. Chile? Yep. I've been to Chile. Damn. Wow. Like uh, a world traveler. And then one of your other locations that has several large telescopes is uh, the Canary Islands. Oh, that sounds like someplace I want to go. Yeah. It's part of Spain, technically, but off the coast of Morocco. And again. Warm. Very warm, very Beaches. dry. Beaches. A large volcano in the middle of the ocean surrounded by beaches because, you know, the island. Beach men to bring me my drinks. I'm sure there are. <laughs> I did not search for beach men when I was there. No. But, yeah. oh. Why didn't you take the jab in Hawaii? Because they gave it to someone else. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Kevin, you should have said you weren't an astronaut. Then they would have given it to you. <laughs> But again, they don't hire astronauts there, so I don't uh, think that would have helped. That wouldn't have helped? No. Okay, don't come to me for advice <laughs> on looking for a job. I, I've already learned that. Yeah. But I have a job that I love, at Expeed Software. There we go. See? Nice job. <laughs> Yay. Yes, we love Rao. Mm -hmm. Owner Xpeed. of Expeed Software. Yeah. CEO. Mm. Yes. And founder. And founder. Yes. All right. Well, I learned a lot about you today, Kevin, even though I work right out by you every day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true. I sometimes I'm not. I'm out at the client site. Yeah. But um, so now I'll be able to go in and discuss data science. That's a lie. I won't come <laughs> in and ever discuss data science I with know. you. <laughs> it's more like, Kevin, what are we doing about lunch today? <laughs> that was today's conversation. Uh -huh. So, but yeah, you know, always happy to talk data science with people, <laughs> even if they don't understand, but have questions to explain oh, it to them. Now, see, this is huge. Do you have a website? Uh, the answer to that is yes. I still have my old website at uh, the OSU domain that has all my astronomy stuff on it. Oh, well, how? Uh, if but people... I don't have a, a new website for data science. What if people want to get a hold of you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Dr. Kevin Croxall, 
That's C-R-O-X-A-L-L. Did I spell that right? You spelled that right. Damn, I'm on fire. He's on LinkedIn. You can message him. He'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs> he is not like one of those. When you think scientist, you think like white coal, white hair, bearded kind of old man. I mean, <laughs> he's not it, clearly. You, you don't portray the typical scientist. So you're and saying you don't I don't have, have a beard. And you have a beard, but it's not like big and white and Santa Clausy, and you don't have a pocket protector. It's true. So I do not have a pocket protector. So, yeah, <laughs> we're good there. He's not like your typical like uptight scientist. Yeah. So he'll answer you, right? No, I I try. You know, it sometimes takes me a while. I've got a little bit of a back- backlog of people I'm answering right now, but. He'll get Try to and you. get around to it. Yeah. Or you can reach me at elizabethtolia.com. And then she'll come in and yell at me for not having answered quick enough. Oh, shoot. I'll answer for him. And then you, <laughs> <laughs> and then you won't get the right answer. <laughs> I can make it sound good, though. I can. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Well, Kevin, thanks for coming on. And um, we'll... We been come, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. You come back and visit us, Darren sure. and I. We could talk about telescopes some more. Yeah. We could talk about telescopes. can talk about statistical methods. Oh, my God. I mean, we didn't even dig into Kevin, you're gonna have Bayesian to Bayesian methods or listen, students' T-tests. We're going to have to make that shit sexy, though. Or, oh, if you want it sexy, <laughs> then you just utter that little simple name of Kamulgarov Shmirnov. <laughs> Ladies, <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> I call it the glitter. What does John call it? The sexy. Do you not? Before I've, we, I before don't we, know what you're talking before about? Before we leave, in our office, I like to call things glitter. Like we have a base model. Let's just get the base model, mm-hmm. and we'll add the glitter as we're working on the base model. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Like. The fancy buttons and whatnot, right? John calls it the sexy. Okay. So he was explaining to me that they were doing a demo today, and he was like, it's, it needs sexy. And I was like, what the hell is sexy? It's like glitter, but it's my word, sexy. So wanted it to be sexy. That, that seems a slightly sexist term. I know, right? Whereas, you know. That's why John will never be on the podcast. Yeah. Keep him away. <laughs> He doesn't listen, so he doesn't get to come on. Or it's glitter. Glitter's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Just adds the sparkle. Sparkle. Just like Liberace. That's right. That's right. Like Elton John. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yes. So maybe instead of, you know, the the glitter, it could be add the 300 pounds of turkey feathers. Okay, well. Because he had, you know, his pink turkey feather robe that Liberace would wear. Who? John? Or Elton John? <laughs> Liberace. Oh, Liberace. <laughs> I thought we were referring back to John. That's John Sarver, by the way. Oh, I will be impressed if he comes in with a 300-pound hot pink turkey feather robe. I will be impressed. We could always look for that on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> would we get to that through your website? You sure would. <laughs> um, we could look for that for him for that outfit. Mm-hmm. He would support it well. Mm-hmm. So... Okay, well, thanks, Kevin, for coming on, and um, always a pleasure, and uh, let's do lunch tomorrow. Sure. Okay, see? All right, thank you. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and leave a review. We will see you next time, and feel free to drop us a line at getwitit.org.